happy Saturday, everybody. You're welcome to the Today's Woman Show. It's a delight to have you on. My name is Rene Q. Boating, and today you're going to be ever so blessed. You'll find out why. We'll be right back. It's time for the woman on the move. This is a female entrepreneur pressing on towards her goal. Let's see who she is this week. AF Fashion is a dressmaking enterprise, mainly into children clothing, located at Santasi Epri in the Kumasi metropolis. I decided to step into dressmaking with the idea of eliminating Ghanaians, bringing in too many brony wear into the system. We are doing adult clothing, yes, but let's move back down a little bit, concentrate on children because there are a lot of influx of children's clothing from outside all reused things. I said, let's get back into the market and then teach people how to use Ghanaian made products for their babies, their children, and let them patronize it. You know, when you wear clothing, it's not just for protecting yourself, like your nudity, no. It's also protecting your integrity. It's also protecting your person. It is portraying an image. It is telling us something. And then at the end of the day, it is also giving you style. Ajua Fusuya has a bachelor's degree in geography and political science from the University of Ghana. But what was the motivation for going into the fashion industry? By the time I was completing, one of my lecturers told me that, Ajua, you are not meant for the classroom. You are supposed to be doing some craft work. So, go and learn something with your hands and start doing it. I looked at him and I was like, what do you mean by that? My parents have spent a lot on me to be in Legon and you want me to go and do some, I don't know what you want me to do. He said, you thank me one day, so I just left. And lo and behold, I had this skill when I was growing up because a lot of people in my house saw. So as I came out of school, um, university graduate, not getting employed, I decided, okay, I have a skill. Nobody taught me. Let me use it. And here we are. She had many dreams, including becoming a journalist. I loved journalism growing up. I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to be a TV personality. I even wanted to be a musician. I wanted to be a movie actor. I mean, when we are young, we just have too many dreams at the same time. So I decided to go to Rabodev when I came out of the uh, university. So I was trained by Tomian and Forsen, Cyril Akolache, Charlie Sam and the likes. And then when I had the training, I set out to get a job in media. I got exposed in the media, yes, but the roles I wanted to play as a presenter, I never got to do it. I got to be marketing, I got to be like a, a sales girl, uh, running around trying to find customers. The company was registered in 2016. And we got all our, our, our documents right with the government. We, we also got our, all our taxes right and then we decided to bring in people to work with us. A friend bought the first machine for me to start. He said he wanted to be part of my success story, so he bought the machine for me. So I started using my sister, as you can see, as my model. I do things, I try it on her, then she takes it out, people see it and they're like, who did this for you? She says, my sister did it. They're like, when did your sister get into fashion and she can do this? Then people start, you know, requesting for things themselves I do put every time I, I bring out something my sister wears the prototype then it goes like boom so um, by so doing we decided to start a business out of it AF fashion has five additional workers and sources all raw materials locally we are able to do uh, roughly like in a day like eight or ten then probably by the end of the week like 40 or 50, depending on the number of orders we have. For many startups, funding has been a challenge. What advice do you have for them? Okay, the advice I'll give 
all of us young people who really want to start a business that starts as small as possible. I started this business with 300 cities. I just got myself a machine, I just got a few uh, threads and I got uh, scissors. I mean the basic, basic things that can help you sew. Then you can move on from there. When you do the right thing, the customer appreciates it, pays for it. Then from one you go to two, from two then you are escalating. Our winning woman for today is Mrs. Doris Ahiati. I call her Lady Doris. So I'll be calling her Lady Doris throughout the show. It's such a blessing to have her on today. She's so busy and I'm so glad that today I've been able to grab her. And today you're going to be so blessed. I mean, the words of wisdom and inspiration, that is what the Today's Woman Show is all about. So get ready. You're so welcome. I'm so glad to have you. Finally, finally, <laughs> we made the day. Thank you. you know, I'll tell you how, how I met her. So I was speaking at a, 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 it's a women's um, networking um, program, yes. And I was on the panel. And before the discussion actually started, you know, there were a few people um, speaking and giving short presentations. And she was one of them who was actually speaking for Sibs, Sibs Africa, which we'll talk about later. And I mean, when she started speaking, I was like, wow. Number one, I need her card. Number two, she's coming on the Today's Woman Show. Number three, she's come to inspire everybody watching. So like I said, sit down, maybe grab a pen and a paper because this woman is a woman of wisdom and knowledge. So you're yeah, welcome again. She's the co-founder and CEO of Crescendo Consult Limited. It's a financial advisory um, company. She's an executive coach and she's also a, it's also a consulting firm. So, um, I mean, I, I read your profile and I was like, my goodness. I, when I finished, it's short, but wow. You know, um, you, you were working at, at Data Bank before. That's right. You were the vice president. Yes. So, why did you leave? <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and there's so much I want to learn about, you know, accounting, which you should teach us. With all this, you know, commotion going around now with microfinancing, you know, microfinance companies and so many people losing their monies, we need to be advised, you know, correctly. Because I hear Data Bank is safe. You know, you know that's what we hear. <laughs> but yes, you know. But but how how was that journey? How did you get yourself, you know, being the vice the vice president? Thank you very much, Renee. Data Bank is a wonderful place to work with. I have to give them that credit. Um, it's an environment that allows everyone that has a growth mindset to thrive and to rise. Mm. Um, I say this because at the time I was recruited, at the same interview, there was a male friend of mine, mm -hmm. um, mate from the university, who yeah. also happened to be recruited. And if you look at the trajectory of progress uh, through the firm, there wasn't much difference. Oh, wow. Notwithstanding okay. the fact that along the line I have to take maternity leave, etc., I think they reward performance and they give you the opportunity right. to also explore. Okay. For example, um, I tend to come up with all sorts of crazy ideas and every now and then I have some idea I present and I'm given the opportunity to try to make execute it, work, right. it, make it work. Wow. And they throw resources behind it. Wow. Yes, so I, so they I believe, believe in their staff they believe they in their the staff. Usually they would go out there to fish out staff that have certain values mm. that align with the company's own values, mm. which include excellence wow. and integrity, mm. leadership. Yeah. So um, I believe once they find the people, they give them all the room to make mistakes. Mm. And I made my fair share of mistakes mm. in there. Mm. Yes, uh, maybe along the line we'll talk about yes, it. Yes. But through it all, they gave me the opportunity. And I think that is how... Uh, I managed to get to where I am. The other factor is God. Mm. Um, when you believe in God and you believe that you are not just here by mistake or that yeah. you are an accident, but you are here with a mission mm -hmm. and you are looking up to the person who puts you here to supply you with the needs yes, in order that. to achieve that mission, yeah. then you just keep going and somehow he helps you to get to where he wants you to get yeah. to. Yeah, I really like what you said because sometimes, you know, a lot of, 
women, men, they already have it within them and they're probably in, a, you know, in a company, in a society, but they doubt themselves and that self-doubt doesn't allow them to come out. So when people ask me sometimes where I get my confidence or craziness in quotes, like how I can just come out and do it, that's what I say, yeah. that is, is believing where I got it from. So if I believe that I got it from God, where is the fear here? You know, so if I'm going to do something and I believe that God gave it to me, how will I fail, basically? Of course, you make mistakes here and there, mm -hmm. but it's, you'll still get up. You'll still get up there. So I really like what you've already said. Now, you have finance. You know, you have, you've been into finance and, and, and accounting for many, many years. Um, a lady told me, so the lady I interviewed before <laughs> you was like, this lady while being... Those were her exact words. She said, this lady is intelligent when it comes to accounting, when it comes to finance. So I, how did you get yourself in accounting and finance? Because growing up, everybody says, I don't like maths. I don't like maths. I mean, that's one subject that people rather run away from. You speak to people, they study psychology in university. Why? Because that's easy. That's what they'll tell you. You know, so how come you actually pressed on to finance and accounting? Thank you very much. It's interesting that you ask this question. I think in my formative years in the primary school, my mathematics numbers were okay. Mm -hmm. Then somewhere beyond basic school, I realized that my performance at maths was declining. Mm -hmm. And I did not understand why, save for the fact that I didn't like my maths teacher then. <laughs> because this maths teacher will come with a cane in hand, yeah. give you some complicated problems to solve and if you don't get it right before you even think about yeah, breaking the yes then the cane is on you so I went back to and I used to keep my text papers so okay. I was going through and I was looking at the scores high 90s so I was asking myself why if I could score these high 90s in the lower primary upper primary then it means that the potential is there for me to do well in mathematics and therefore I should just stop paying attention to this particular teacher mm. And I should change my attitude towards him. How old were you? I would have been 11, 12 years and old. And you did that yourself? Yes. <laughs> because I, I just couldn't crack it. I didn't like the scores. I was scoring below 50. Mm. So it beats no, my no, mind. I mean, you, you could think like that. You could look at it, compare, and even tell yourself to change your mindset at 11. Yes. Yes, I thought that there's something about the teacher I had become scared of the teacher. Mm. When he comes to the classroom, I'm not paying attention, I'm not listening. And so mathematical problems are like stories. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to read, understand, and then crack break it, them, baby. crack it, yes. break it apart. Now, if you are afraid when the equation is put in front of you, your brain you sort of shuts. It. Yes, so you can't, you can't understand. You cease to think, and therefore you can't solve the problem. Right. So deciding to go at it again and believing that if I could score high 90s sometime, then it means the same brain has the capacity right. to do it now. Right. So now I didn't pay attention to the teacher when he came to the class. I just tried to focus on what he's trying to do. And I also adopted the attitude of reading ahead of the teacher. So I tried to... Um, have some background before he comes in, if I know what topic or chapter we are on, mm -hmm. so that he doesn't put me under too much pressure right. to try and uh, solve his problems. And, and I steadily got over it, wow. and I carried on like that through secondary school. I had a habit of every morning solving a few mathematical problems, and that was thanks to advice by my dad. He encouraged me that in secondary school I should do that and it will help me to keep my performance up. Mm -hmm. And I think that is what helped me. So generally I developed the attitude that just calm down, relax, look at it and try to see what you can do about it. And I found that my, my brain works better that way. But I, <laughs> even that's a fantastic um, way of thinking for any problem. That's it? true. Yeah. That's true. For, for most situations that I've had to deal with... Um, through career, through pregnancy, child raising, everywhere, social problems, extended family. Um, I always adopt that approach. Breathe, calm down. Now think through it. Because I, I realize that somehow I think better when I'm not um, scared. Yeah. So 
did you actually decide that you wanted to press on and follow on in, in accounting, in maths, in, in, in finance? Is that what you were going to do? Yes, um, but not a very, very precise yes, because then I didn't understand what finance and all that entailed. Mm -hmm. I knew what I wanted to do. And I was saying this at the UG graduation a couple of weeks back. I said that I wanted to sit in an office and I wanted to think about problems and come up with solutions to those problems. Mm. That's what I thought I wanted mm. to do. Um, I didn't have a name to it. So um, based on my attitude and tendencies at home, my parents tend to guide us to choose something that aligns with our attitude at home. So I found myself in the social sciences okay. based on his advice. So I was studying economics, I was studying geography, and that's good. So based on, on your, on your, you know, that, that's what your parents thought it would be good for you. Yes, based on okay. my attitude at yes. home. Yes, okay. <laughs> and and some, of, some of those attitudes growing up are funny. Uh, my sister was telling my husband the other day when he visited him, visited her, sorry, that as a child, you would find me sitting quietly somewhere playing with a toy and I'm talking to the toy, I'm advising the toy. <sighs> and so living life abundantly between myself and objects and things wow. around. So I can retreat and think about things and mm. I can play out situations. Mm. So I think all that contributed and they saw this child to um, also have the tendency to look at problems, try to address it. So we went on the path of economics and um, at a much senior level in the university, the options available were administration. Now I had a better understanding mm. So I went into the, the Bachelor of Science Administration, and then you have to specialize. Right. So you do a foundation in accounting, quantitative methods, marketing, human resource management, organizational behavior, and all that. And then when it came time to specialize, I realized that I really loved banking and finance. Mm. So that's how I, I ended up in banking and finance. And I've always loved it and continue to grow deeper in banking and finance. One, because it helped to understand and address financial problems that people have. Mm -hmm. You see, everyone's life at some point is touched by finances. Yes. And um, we also say that finance in business happens to be the lifeline or the blood. Yes, exactly. Somehow, even in our personal lives, mm -hmm. you know, uh, there's a song that says, Sikaya Moja. Yeah. Not everybody understands money. Mm. And... I had had experiences and opportunities all the way from primary school where I was given money to handle. So that may also be why I easily gravitated towards mm -hmm. banking and finance. I had been treasurer when we formed the Bible study group in primary school. Um, in the senior secondary school as well, I was treasurer. So people kept oh, entrusting wow. their money to yes, me. Yes. And so that also naturally had equipped me with some basic skills in managing the funds mm -hmm. and Naturally, I continued in studying banking and finance. Um, and then along the line, I thought that, you know, the capital market is not enough to just have money, put it in a bank, borrow and all that, which is what banking is about. Yeah. But there is an investment side where you actually put the money to a certain strenuous use. You sweat it and you get better returns. It's more risk you are taking, but you get yeah, better yeah, returns we'll there. about that, the risk. <laughs> wow. So... Then I took the securities courses and I graduated with the degree and then the stock market courses as well. And then along the line, I enrolled to do the chartered banking. So I was just going deeper and deeper. <laughs> I I'm said I wanted to, to be an you were, expert. You, you were swimming in it. Oh yes. my goodness, going deeper. Yes, I've always enjoyed it. So I went deeper, did the chartered professional in, in banking. And then I also went back to do the um, master's in finance. Wow. Yeah, and I've practiced in that space. One person that I has made quite a great impact on me, um, he's currently the director general of the Securities and Exchange Commission. When I was being recruited to Data Bank, asked me how long I was going to stay. I said, oh, I will stay a very long time. So he actually asked you that? Yes. When, when you were being recruited? Yes, okay. at the interview. I think they wanted somebody that would be loyal. Mm. So I said, I'll be there for a long time. I was, he, he asked how long. I said, three years. He said, wow. Because I had been just one year 
and the previous job I had been just a couple of months and I kept moving to something. It was all in the area of banking and finance, but I was but moving you pretty moving? fast. Is it that you wanted something that was more challenging? challenging? Okay. Yes, something more challenging. And so at, after three years in data bank, I was going to leave to do my master's. That was the plan. But then I also wanted to become an expert. And he advised me that it took on average 10 years to become oh, an expert. Wow. And I was really hungry to become an expert. Like, like, <laughs> why? What was it? What, what was it? Was it just, um, you know, was it just the, the, the name, like the title, just to say that I'm an expert in this? Or is it just something that deep within you, you wanted to just see what it would be like or feel what it would be like? What was the reason? Why were you pushing to be an expert? Okay. So I, I've always seen myself to be a helper. So when I was treasurer, I was helping with the management of the funds. When funds were idle, I would actually turn it around for it to grow a bit okay. for whichever group I was treasurer to. Mm -hmm. I didn't mention at one time I was treasurer to a French club at the okay. University of Ghana oh, wow. as well. So it, it was the desire to help. And when you are an expert and you are helping people, you give them the right the kind right of help. You, you don't make mistakes. You don't, you don't expose them to unnecessary risks. Mm. So that was the driving um, force for me to become an expert. So when he said it would take 10 years, I, I stayed at Data Bank for over 12 years. Wow. Yes, before leaving. Was it, was it because of the advice he gave you? Partly that. And Were you actually growing as well? In the I was company? growing and I was not getting bored. Oh, that's great. That's great. <laughs> I get bored if I can predict outcomes. I'm a bit adventurous. So when I'm working on a project, I don't want to be able to exactly predict how the outcome is going to be. If I'm able to predict it precisely and the outcome is the same a couple of times, it's, it starts... So you think that it's, then it's not like, you're sort of like you're above that, like you're not utilizing your brain enough, basically. Is that what it is? Or it's not challenging enough, basically? For me, it feels like I cooked it up. Really? Because I could see the end, and I started working towards it, and in the end, it was what I had seen. But isn't that easier? <laughs> I don't like to cook up things. <laughs> I want to make a discovery at the end of the day. But I think it came in handy when I was a research analyst, and you have to do projections, forecasts. Mm. You have to look into the future. And you have to do analysis for some of the listed companies, forecast how their performance is going to be based on which you calculate um, what we call an internal value, intrinsic value. Based on that, you recommend whether investors should buy or sell a particular stock. Right. But it came very handy being able to see things, um, how they are likely to be, and sometimes getting really close um, outcomes in relation to what you had predicted. Oh, wow. <laughs> now, I mean, this, this industry, you find more men than women in this industry. So I'm glad that you're saying that you actually worked for a company that allowed women to grow as well. And, and that's, you know, kudos to Data Bank for that, for not looking, you know, at that. But have you ever felt in this industry that you were not given, and it, it could be anywhere at, mm. a, at any point, um, have you ever felt like, you know, you didn't have, the, or you haven't gotten the clients that you could get because you're a woman? Have you ever felt that way? Or you haven't reached or gotten certain things that you could have gotten because you're a woman? Do you feel like sometimes certain things are given to men? You know, and you know, sometimes you get to a meeting, like a, you know, a lady was, was, was saying to me that you know, her name is um, it's a unisex name. So she, she, she went to this meeting and her potential um, clients came in. And when they came, the first thing they said was, you're a woman? You know, and probably if they had known that she was a woman, they probably wouldn't even have booked that meeting because of the job that it was and because of the money that was also involved in it. So mm -hmm. do you think this industry is one that is um, perceived to be like a male industry? I have been thinking really hard, racking my brains to see if I'll find one personal example. Unfortunately, I don't have one personal that's example. That's, that's more fortunate. <laughs> but I'm very, I'm very aware that these are real issues in the finance industry. These, these are real issues, and um, I'm on a number of committees and groups that try to 
um, support and encourage women, equip them with the skills that they need to be able to thrive in the field of finance. Generally, it's a tough and stressful environment, very fast paced. Mm. And so some people have the concern or reservation that a woman may not be so fast. Mm. But I'm also aware that some women can prove themselves. Mm. And once they see that you've proven yourself, I think they give you the they opportunity. Trust, trust. For example, there was a time when I would go to the office with spare underwear and toothbrush and things in my handbag. So if it became necessary for me to fly out to some meeting somewhere and sleep over, that I could do that. Mm. So that without was going back home. without going back home. So I, I came to work. I'm in the office and I have to attend a meeting and sleep over in Takradi or somewhere. I should be able to go without. That's what the man will do, right? Mm, yeah, true, true. They would go and true. sometimes just buy underwear. Yeah, no, sure. and, and these are the little, little things but at that... At the time, were you married? At the time, I was not married. Okay. okay at the time... I, I want to talk about later on, we'll talk about how, you know, how you could sort of rise up. Um, in a corporate world or in and even even in your own business and all that as a married woman and also a mother you know when you're young and and single you can you know quickly do all those things easily but imagine you had two children at home and a husband you probably can't just take that thinking you know what you know if I don't come I don't come but what I want to ask you now is mm -hmm. you said at, at the beginning you said that we, we don't a lot of people don't understand money Yes. I, yeah, I want you to speak to us on that. What do you mean by, you know, we don't, and how, what, 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 what does it take for us to understand money? Okay. I'll come at it this way. When you have studied money and when you have studied finance, you understand that time is money. Mm -hmm. And so in the field of banking and finance, there's something we call, and in the field of investment, we call time value of money. Mm -hmm. So we actually... Um, say something like a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. Now, this is not just something we say in person. There's a meaning behind it. Mm. The meaning being that if you have one dollar today or if you have one Ghana CD today, you can actually turn it around. You can do something with it to increase its value by tomorrow. And I said that there's this time value of money and time is money. Yeah. Because once the money is in your hand, you can put it to work the same way when you don't have money and you have time. You can use that time to do something that will earn you something that is valuable. And sometimes people have the opportunity to do something that will earn them money and they will not mm. make it. And sometimes we make decisions that cost us. Yeah. So it actually, the decision, the choice we've made takes money away, away. from us. And one of such instances is wastage. You go to the sink, you turn on the tap, and it's just running. By the end of the month, you pay water bill. So you Maybe leave the AC on. Are, most of us are guilty to this. Let's listen. You leave the AC on, or you go to your refrigerator to pick some vegetables from the vegetable bin, and the fridge door is ajar while you're selecting the vegetables. But you could actually just pull the bin out, close the fridge door. I did that this morning. <laughs> Don't worry, I used to do that too. <laughs> so, so these attitudes and habits and how we carry on in a 24-hour so period, I can choose to just go and sit um, by the roadside and stare into space, watch and count the cars passing by, and it is money that I'm wasting. Because you can be working. You I can be, be working. Something. I can be doing something valuable. Yes. Even if it doesn't put actual cash in my hand, it will add value to somebody's life. So then it compels you to reassess yourself and um, identifying your purpose yeah. so that every time, what, however many minutes or hours you have in a day, that you put it to good use. Yeah. You're either developing yourself so that you're becoming a better version of yourself or you are giving a bit of yourself to other people. But with this sort of notion, wouldn't it make you a bit like, you know, at every point you're thinking, can I be doing something? Can you rest? Like, you know, can you just relax without thinking that time, this is this. You know, there are some people that are um, like nerds in yeah, a way yeah. that are so serious about everything. You don't seem that kind at all, actually. You seem so, I mean, I wouldn't have guessed that you, you have this sort of, I, I don't know, you have this sort of... <laughs> 
<laughs> you don't see that 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 kind of at, at all. But then, don't you think that something that can be a bit too serious, strenuous? Hmm. It could, but if you approach it with a mindset that you have today and you are living today as best as you can, mm -hmm. and that includes taking time to enjoy the flowers along the way, um, there's something I learned from my husband. I have to give him the credit. So I'm coming for a meeting at Mervyn Peak. I get to the reception counter. I see Alpha there, and I engage him, and I ask him, where is Omega? Felix is standing next to him, and he goes like, right here. So we are having fun enjoying it, but I was on a business mission, all right. Mm. So find a way to engage with the people around, around you. you, because we are social beings, and it is essential that you have those interactions and engagement. And the memories that you make, the experiences that you make in any particular day, count to your well-being. Yeah. So you, you should just be mindful of all that. I have a purpose. I'm going on a mission. I'm a human being. And because I'm a human being, I should pay attention to the people along the way. And it's a beautiful world we have out here. So let me also enjoy it, enjoy it smell the flowers, enjoy the sunshine. And if it is rainfall, even if it soaks you, that's all part of yeah. the blessing. Enjoy it and, and then carry on. Yeah. Now, you're a financial advisor. I mean, not, ev not, not everybody watching now can probably afford your services or even have time to find you to come. Now, I want you to advise everybody now. I mean, there's been so many things, I know you know about it, going on about everybody trying to quickly make some money. Mm -hmm. So they probably have 1,000 CDs, 100 CDs, 500 CDs, and they've gone and put it in a microfinance company that has collapsed now. Mm. I mean, there are so many stories going around. I got a friend of mine sent me a WhatsApp video that I watched, and my heart was broken. Mm. I thought it was a funeral. There were so many men sitting down with red um, strips Bam. of cloth yeah, on their heads, some on their wrists and everything. So when I saw it, before I opened it, I thought, oh, my goodness, I hope she's not telling me somebody has passed away. And it was actually a story, I think it was something on the news or something, you know, and the gentlemen were saying that if we don't get our money back, we'll die. You know, but at that time, they were also thinking that, let me use, and it's, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. I mean, some people have collapsed. You know, some people have died even because they were investing their money. They saw that as an investment. So was that a wrong decision? So just a bit of financial advice. So there's so many women watching. Men as well love the Today's Woman show. But, you know, what kind of advice can you give us generally on, on, on building our money? Maybe even money is at home. So we don't have that much. We are not with all these huge banks. We've worked a bit. We've gotten some money. But we also want to make something of the money. Mm. It's, it's heartbreaking. I mean, I was just reflecting of people that I learned had miscarried. Miscar yes, oh there's, there's been miscarriages resulting from um, the banking debacle. So I really feel what people out there are feeling. The advice I will give to listeners out there when it comes to investing is that um, in investing, you get rewarded for the risk that you actually take. And the higher the risk you get, you take in, the higher the returns you are going to receive from your investment. So those who are very familiar with interest rates, whenever somebody promises you a very high interest rate, you should be mindful of the fact that the risk that you are taking is also very high. And um, if you are taking very high risk in order to earn any return, you should also note that there's a very high possibility that you will lose your principal, yeah. that money that you are putting wow. in. In investment advisory, we will always do a risk um, tolerance level assessment before we recommend anything for you. So we need to know whether you are extremely risk averse, which means that you can't tolerate any amount of risk at all. Or you have a moderate risk appetite. You can tolerate some amount of risk, which means if you should lose part of your investment, you are not likely to be suicidal or mm. to miscarry. Right. Okay, so different people have different That's tolerance right. levels. And you should be honest in the feedback that you give. And based on that feedback, we are able to actually categorize. Sometimes you would come across somebody that's advanced in age, maybe 60 year old, and you are doing the assessment and he's looking like he's got a high appetite for risk. 
but you advise him against going for investment that will give him very high returns and therefore a very high risk mm. investment because he doesn't have too much time to recover. Yeah. Yeah. When you go into a risky investment, you are likely to make losses. Mm. If you don't make losses, you end up with very high returns. Mm. Now, if you should make losses, you should be in a position where you have enough time and resources to recover. I mean, that will not be your end. Yeah. At 60 years, you don't have too much time to recover because the average life expectancy for the Ghanaian man is something yeah. below 60. Yeah. Let's say you go to 80. That's 20 years. But if you take a 40-year-old man... Maybe the 20 years, can you work that hard to, to recover it? You could. If you still have a high appetite for risk. Okay. Because investment returns are always in cycles. We have the down times and then we have the uh, peak moments okay. when the economy is um, buoyant and you're able to right. get very good returns. Mm -hmm. So if you have many years to live, then you are likely to see right. more booming seasons when you can make those returns. So know yourself and understand how much risk you can contain. Mm -hmm. If you put your money somewhere and the following day you go and you find out that the money you, the actual principal you put there has dipped by a couple of CDs and it will bother you. You shouldn't do investments that are risky at all. You should do treasuries. They are called risk-free rate investments. They give you returns that are assured. You are lending to the government of Ghana or to whichever government that you find yourself um, living under. And sovereigns tend to pay into perpetuity, the new government that will come will pay. Okay. So yes, you are, you are safe when you okay. invest in government securities. But even so, you have to check how it is being packaged mm. because you may end up in an investment house that tells you this is treasury bill, but it actually isn't. Oh, wow. so, yes, so if you buy a real, you know there are um, fixed deposits yes. that may have cycles that behave like the government of Ghana. Mm. So if you want the treasury bill, for the particular country you are in the government, then you should ask for that particular treasury right. okay. government, not just any fixed right. deposit. That's risk-free. Mm. If you have a high appetite for risk, then you can do the stock markets. That's where you have the markets crashing and you can you know, lose this, this, everything. This sort of thing is mainly for like, um, you know, for, you know, the, the, maybe the, 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 I don't know the best way to put it, like probably like, you know, the, the educated, you know, you find that a lot of people who are crying and who are so down and everything are people who probably don't have like the greatest of jobs or don't have mm. access to this sort of advice. <sighs> when you say they don't have access to this sort of advice, I think it's the attitude that the average Ghanaian may have, mm -hmm. you know, we don't ask. Mm. We don't ask because at Data Bank when I was there, all the time we had people that would walk in or would call and would ask questions. Mm. But even beside those that would take the initiative to come and find out, we always had financial literacy programs. Mm -hmm. What we are doing at Crescendo Consult is also to bridge the gap. Mm -hmm. And so our clients have access to us when they are taking an investment decision of significant importance, they call us to find out, I'm considering taking this loan. Okay. This is the purpose. What do you think? Mm. Then we'll guide them through, we just talk to them. It's like also seeking the services of somebody, a professional. Mm -hmm. And it's another thing that we don't do. Um, sometimes we take things for granted. Yeah. I have medical doctor friends, and there are things I consult them on. Because I'm not a medical doctor, yeah. even though I've read a bit. Sure. Oh, sure. <laughs> so it's yeah. the same. Um, yeah. I have tax consultant friends. When there's something about taxation, I'm not too sure. I talk to them. We okay. have to learn. You, you, we you have, have to, to learn. Sure. But we always put a price tag on them. That's what I've observed we do in Ghana. We never talk to lawyers because we think lawyers are expensive. expensive. And so by the time we are engaging a lawyer, it is really expensive mm. because we are in trouble. Yeah. But if you had a lawyer on retention, if you had a financial advisor on retention, mm. the, the charge isn't much. There isn't too much work to be done. And everybody is happy. Yeah. But if you and wait safe. until, and save, but if you wait until you are in trouble before you start looking, sometimes it's too late and it ends up too expensive. Oh, wow. Wow, that, that's so true. Yeah, so I think ladies out there, 
um, and any other persons, I <laughs> men. A lot should, of men love the show. <laughs> you should, you should, you should ask. It's okay to ask. You don't know, um, or you are just curious, or take interest in things. Don't just think that um, money matters happen by chance or by accident. I think that um, doing well with your finances take effort, and you should invest that effort into making sure your finances are secured. Yeah, I like what you said as well about, you know, knowing the kind of risk you're going into. Mm -hmm. And you also play a role in, in a sense, you know. It's like when generally, you know, when certain all these things come up and they promise you such high interest rates, you are so excited to go and take that, you know. So you go in and then you put your money there. But when it doesn't work, then you are so, so angry. But you took that decision. So you should also be, you know, sort of, you know, basically that's what you've said. Be open to the fact that it may not work, you know, but I think sometimes as well, those sort of companies lie to the people, you know, and then if they don't come for advice, then hey, you know, they, they've lost it. Now, how, how can somebody reach you and what, 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 what will they be coming to you for? I want you to explain to everybody so that we learn, because this is a great show, a lot of the things that the women come here on to do, I mean, to say a lot of the time it inspires people and everything, but we also have to learn, mm -hmm. okay? We have to learn that I need to have a financial advisor, you know, I need to have a, a, a consultant, I need, for, for what reason? So why should somebody come and see you and what would they be getting from you? Thank you, Renee. <laughs> so somebody coming to see me would be coming to if it's an individual, will be signing up for personal financial planning. So for personal financial planning, we would start with a budget. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll take stock of your current financial situation to see what assets you have, what um, property I'm trying yeah. to use. <laughs> so that I'm using a technical lay layman can understand. <laughs> So I think in three, they will say mm -hmm. So you're looking at your the assets, things you the have. things you have that have some value, value we can put okay. monetary value on. And then we'll also look at your liabilities, which will be things that you owe or things that you currently have that you must return. Mm. So maybe you went and borrowed money from a bank or you borrowed a car or you've rented an apartment that you have to pay for. Mm. These are your liabilities. Mm. And then how you also... Um, should I say, keep yourself from day to day, your sustenance, right. living expenses. Right. So we take stock of all that. And then um, sometimes we have to work for a period so that we can establish how much on average you need for your living expenses over a month's mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. um, estimate what your utilities are. And then we also check how much wastages are in there. Mm. We look at how much you are earning and then we have to do a plan of um, how you're going to spend whatever you are earning. Mm. Sometimes we need to create additional avenues for you to earn more because yeah, we find you know, out that you are spending. That, that, and that's why I <laughs> asked you this question because a lot of people are living above what they are earning. Yeah. A lot, many. So if you are in that situation, you should immediately be looking out for alternative income sources. And there are income lines that you can create alongside if you have a day job, um, nine to five kind of job. There are things that you can do. Um, for example, you may run an online business on the side. Mm -hmm. Some people like to go into writing or something mm -hmm. in the media, blogging. Um, these are things that you can do at your um, leisure, leisure time. time. And so it, it, it gives you additional income, all right, but it doesn't require you to be sitting in a particular place from 9 to 10. Yeah. Um, there are those that do um, network marketing. Mm. Um, there are cosmetic companies and yeah. health products yeah. that you can do uh, you can along be, those yeah. lines. And then there is investing as well. If you invest wisely, you can actually use that as a means to generate additional income um, streams. Mm. Now, um, a few weeks ago, I think, you were mm. one of the main speakers at the graduation ceremony of the University of Ghana. Mm. Congratulations for being called to all these things and all that. I think you're doing such a great job, really. I have to commend you for that. And I want you to share with us some of the thoughts that you shared with the graduates. Okay. You know, we have to learn as well. And, I, and now that you're sitting here, I really want to 
get everything out of you. <laughs> so people watch will be like, oh my goodness, I've had like a whole session of finance advice. So yeah. what, 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 uh, what, what, were, what, what were the thoughts that you shared, you know, with the graduates? Okay. I, I was drawing attention to the fact that with the advent of the digital revolution, advances in artificial intelligence and machine learning, that everybody needs to learn to be a leader of themselves, self-leadership. Because with the advances in artificial intelligence, there are concerns and issues that are coming up. One of them is trust issues. Um, how can I be sure that this smiling profile on this person's account is actually that person? That person. Sometimes you find out it's a male and you saw a beautiful smiling lady <laughs> and you think you are dating them. Yes, <laughs> but so there are serious trust issues. And um, another issue or concern that comes up is identity mm. issues, identity theft. You leave your footprints all over the web and you can have um, fraudsters, yeah. people fishing, yeah. hackers that would be able to access yeah. your information and now go and put themselves out as you. Mm. It's a risk mm. that you must know how to navigate. Mm. We also no longer have the physical work environment that we used to have. So you, go, you wake up in the morning, you dress up, get ready to go to work. And because it's within a certain geographical um, area. area, all the people that you are working with most likely have certain shared common values coming from certain cultural backgrounds. But now the work environment is virtual. You may be working from your bedroom, from the kitchen, and um, the people that you are working with on your team are outside of your geographical yeah, yeah, boundary yeah. and their values and cultural background may be very different. Yeah. So you have arising very complex issues at work. Mm. You need to be smart emotionally and intellectually to be able to navigate this kind of terrain. And you would not have somebody to hold your hand and to lead you and guide you mm. like you may have had a supervisor yes, sitting next yes. to you who can read your body language yes. and say, mm -mm. You can quickly run yes, to yes. And, yeah. Now you are in your home or kitchen and you are running this. So you have to be emotionally intelligent. Mm. Um, you have to take up the responsibilities of leading yourself mm. so that in making choices online, um, in making decisions as to what you do in the workplace, that you are taking responsibility, that you are being accountable to yourself and so that you are able to excel mm -hmm. at whatever you do, so that um, you are able to read and empathize and understand the complex situation that will arise in the workplace because you are working with people that don't share your yeah, values, yeah. don't share your culture, and yet you must get the work done. Don't share maybe even your time. Yeah, time maybe zone, you know? time zone. And um, you also see that in this era, organizational hierarchy structures have become flatter. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to speak up. You don't have to go through three people or four people before it gets to the top. Mm. You self-managing uh, teams. Mm. You, you can come together and say, we've seen this waste problem here. Let's come together and solve it. And that's a team. You have to organize yourselves and then also decide who is playing which role. It's pretty flat. You have to be assertive. You have to speak up. Um, and so you must learn excellent communication skills. Mm. Some of these things come with practice. You will make mistakes along the way, but it gets better if you don't decide to shut up. Mm -hmm. And um, then also networking. Yeah, which is important. Yes, very important. Um, some of the people that you meet, um, you may not have immediate need for them, but you should still meet you them and keep them in your network anyway. You should have people from different fields, especially fields that you don't have expertise mm -hmm. in. You don't only network in your industry. You should go outside. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say that is um, you can only know so much. And wherever you are handicapped, somebody in your network should complement. Mm -hmm. What you don't know, what's, whatever decision you are likely to make that would boomerang, would yield backfire. Mm -hmm. You have somebody that can advise you that, no, this doesn't work like this because they are an architect and you are thinking of building your house this way or that factory this way. Mm -hmm. And they can give you the architectural perspective, yeah. which will save you so much. Mm -hmm. So you should network 
um, whenever you have the opportunity. You, you, you never know. Thank, Thank you, you so much. It's, it's been awesome. So many other things I wanted to ask, but maybe we'll do a part two and mm -hmm. I'll let you come back because there's so many other things that I wanted, I wanted you to touch on as well, but, you know, for sake of time, we'll do it another time. Sure. Okay, so thank you so much. So, ladies, you heard it all. I mean, we keep learning. There's no day that I think you should wake up and say that I have gotten it. I have a degree. I have a master's, PhD, whatever. Mm -hmm. There's no day that you could get up and say that I've learned it all. You can learn from your child. You can learn from your help. You can learn from anybody, and we should keep learning, and you have to keep watching the Today's Woman show because the women who come on here are winning women. They have a wealth of knowledge to share with all of us. Thank you so much. We'll be right back. Today has been awesome, 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 and I'm really, really praying that the today's woman in you has told herself that I can make it and I will make it. And now we are going to be taking our money seriously. Time is money and money is blood, literally. So we really have to take it seriously. I want to wish you all the very best and don't limit yourself. Keep telling yourself, I can do it and I will. Many thanks to our sponsors. This show won't be possible without you, the Moving Pick Ambassador Hotel for allowing us to use your set. Many thanks to GTP and also to Yaz. And don't miss it next week, 11 a.m. on TV3 and DSCB channel 279. Stay blessed.